Assalamualaikum. I'm Dr. Tahira and you're all watching program Health is Wealth on PTV World. We all love to move our joints and play sports, but we don't know how to handle an injury, whether it's of the shoulder, the knee or the hip. So that is why here we are today at Dr. Anwar Kiani Orthopedic and Sports Surgeons Clinic to discuss all we need to do about sports injury as well as to keep our joints moving and healthy. So Dr. Anwar Kiani, you are an orthopedic and a sports surgeon and you have specialized in sport injuries as well. And we have a very, very sad phase in the time of Pakistan sports right now because all our cricketers and our squash players and everybody almost was injured very lately and also their health is not, you know, I think, I think it's the health or the practice or I don't know what is it that's keeping them from winning the titles like they used to in the past. So what is the reason for these sports injuries and how are they being managed? I'm talking in general, why? Because as a whole, the population itself ignores these sports injuries. As a result, we don't have very healthy athletes anymore. Well, thank you very much, uh, first of all, for um, asking me and, in, uh, and uh, visiting me. I'm Dr. Anwar Kiani. I'm an orthopedic and sports surgeon. Uh, your question is very important, why we are not winning. And uh, the problem is, uh, as a society, we don't have any awareness about uh, staying fit and uh, especially in sports, uh, it's not just the physical fitness, it's the mental fitness as well. Uh, what I would say, uh, in, I've, I've trained in the UK and I spent about 17 years uh, over there and all the clubs, they do have uh, uh, a physiotherapist, uh, a, a doctor and also they have a, a sports psychologist. Oh. So I think uh, we, don't, uh, we don't have something like that over here. Uh, we have very talented players. If you uh, look into cricket, look into squash, look into hockey as well. Our hockey team is doing mm -hmm. so well recently. Uh, they need a mental s support as well, uh, along with their uh, trainers and, and physical uh, support staff as well. So I think that's, that's a very important uh, aspect they should uh, hire some uh, sports psychologist and uh, they should uh, train them and that's the it, it brings the competitiveness. We have a GP with us and uh, with our teams even that with, is only with the national team and not with the other teams but what if we have proper as you said you're a sports doctor you're a proper sports orthopedic surgeon and somebody comes up with an injury for example if they have a shoulder injury let's start with the shoulder injury because that was the most common with cricket players especially the bowlers yeah. and we are strong with bowlers so how does one go about with a shoulder injury? Well, uh, the most important aspect is uh, knowing your limits mm -hmm. and uh, also, uh, the, especially if I talk about fast bowlers, I have been playing cricket and I'm, I was a bowler as well. So you need uh, your fitness at, at maximum level and, and uh, the second thing is when uh, you have any injury, you should not uh, ignore it. and. Uh, uh, support I think in, in Pakistan, uh, 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 sports staff is not as good as, as uh, abroad, I would say. Uh, because uh, if you remember, Naseem Shah, he got injured just mm. before the World Cup. Right. And I think that was the lethal blow to the Pakistan team, yeah. to be honest. Uh, he must be having problems a uh, few months before, to be honest. But they kept on them. ignoring him and uh, mm. uh, they might have t thought about minor aches and mm. stuff. The shoulder is a very important joint and shoulder has uh, four important tendons attached inside the joint mm -hmm. and uh, they function, uh, the, especially the fast bowlers there and shoulder has the most range of movements. I mean it moves in many directions I would mm -hmm. say, say for simplicity. So they, they need to be uh, strengthened, they need to be looked after and for, for their strength that brings the pace in their bowling and their other core muscle strength and their exercises and combining all of that, that uh, and that's, that's why the fast bowling is, is a difficult thing. But while you were in England, a lot of players used to come to you over there, I, I think you were in NHS or whichever yes. hospital it was, but what, what, how was it different there? How was the treatment of a dislocated shoulder or a frozen shoulder different there from what is being done here and how did you go about it there and what would you suggest to the players here? Well, uh, for uh, uh, shoulder injuries, if I talk about sports injuries, 
uh, fitness is, is the key point. Uh, and I've seen many patients in uh, uh, NHS uh, UK, uh, mostly in Leeds region and in Bristol region, I trained there as well. So uh, what we, over there, uh, the sports people, they are quite uh, aware of their uh, uh, strengths and weaknesses. Okay. So what they do, they do proper exercises. If they have injury, they have proper rehab. Mm. Over here, uh, people, they don't uh, emphasize on their workouts, on their fitnesses. And also, uh, when they have an issue, they do not visit uh, their, uh, any, any sports surgeon. Unfortunately, we don't have many sports surgeons in exactly. Pakistan. And we don't mm. even know the difference between a normal orthopedic surgeon and a specific sports surgeon. Sports surgery is, uh, is a specialized field in, in the UK and US, I would say, and in Europe as well, where uh, the surgeons who have a uh, liking to these injuries, they, they train in those specific fields. And that actually includes uh, arthroscopic surgery. Arthroscopic surgery, I'll explain, is a keyhole surgery. Okay. In, and in every so it's joint. Minimally invasive. Minimally invasive, yes. No bleeding, uh, no pain, and quick Yes, recovery. absolutely. From, right. If I start from ankle, knee, hips, and shoulders, most commons are knees and shoulders. Mm -hmm. But we have been trained to do a keyhole surgeries on these joints. Okay. And there are multiple ligaments and mm -hmm. key structures in every joint. So we, first of all, uh, I would say, if I take example of the shoulder over here Why in don't Pakistan. you demonstrate it on the shoulder? Yeah, I think uh, yes, this is, I have got yes, a shoulder model. And uh, the issue is, uh, in Pakistan, to be honest, uh, training system is so poor mm -hmm. that even people do not know how to examine properly a shoulder. Because okay. on examination, we can get to a provisional diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So we have to diagnose that which tendon is injured, which tendon is involved, and where is the source of pain. Exactly. So if we don't have that understanding, we can't treat it. Uh, and, and very honestly, a lot of patients, uh, sports people, mm -hmm. come to me here, and uh, they have visited a few other orthopedic surgeons which are not specialized, and they feel shy of sending them to a shoulder surgeon. Right. Unfortunately, there are only two or three shoulder surgeons in Islamabad. So do they understand the difference between a dislocated shoulder or a frozen shoulder and that, it's, and that only those injections are not going to help? So yeah. if, I, if I say, if I say there are a few things, if we are looking into mm -hmm. it, there are a few things which I was talking about rotator cuff muscles. So this, right. is, this is a scapula. It's okay. just on the back of our chest. Exactly, and right if I here. show you the back side, mm -hmm. so there are two important muscles, which is one is supraspinatus mm -hmm. and the other is called infraspinatus. This okay. whole, whole foci is covered with the infraspinatus. And on humerus, mm -hmm. if uh, we see it here, mm -hmm. the infraspinatus is attached here. Supraspinatus is attached on the greater tuberosity, okay. and we see this tendon, which is a long head of biceps tendon, which, okay. which is intraarticular. It's inside the joint, and it's attached, and in becoming a mus muscle here, and the, the most the, another anterior rotator cuff muscle is called uh, subscapularis, which 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 whole muscle is here, uh, just behind our chest wall and around the chest wall, and it is attached here. So when the shoulder moves. These four tendons are important yeah. when we are throwing some object or we're doing lifting a bowling well. or lifting. Mm -hmm. And so this is very important. And then this is a ball and socket joint. What I would say is there's a glenoid and it has labrum on it. When shoulder dislocates, you can imagine it's not going to dislocate because this is a, a plastic right. model. Mm -hmm. But this whole head comes moves and it. comes out mm -hmm. and goes out of it. So when it goes out, it damages this part okay. as well. So, so it's it, damaging the tendon as well as it's coming out of its socket. Mostly the labrum and the, and the capsule in front, which okay. is damaged, and this head goes in front here. Oh. So that's an acute injury. In a teenager group, if it dislocates, mm. it's a nasty injury because they, they'll keep on having dislocations oh, in future. Again and again? Uh, yes, again and again. And if uh, a, a person who's in, let's say, in his 40s or mm. uh, mid-30s, if they dislocate due to any trauma or mm. a fall, uh, the risk of instability is unlikely. So if it dislocates, then it definitely in early age group, they need to be evaluated clinically okay. and uh, investigations wise, they need to have an MRI scan. And is it repairable? Because you know, we have a lot of young squash players, people playing tennis, especially children nowadays during the summer vacations and they're playing and some of them might get us, you know, a mild dislocation or something like that. So what is the surgery for it or how is it fixed by a person like you, by a both surgeon in particular. Yes, uh, there are two ways to tr uh, treat these okay. issues. 
uh, when we get an MRI scan, we see a few things. One is uh, how much the head of humerus is damaged. Okay. We call it hill sac lesions. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing which we see, the glenoid. If the right. bone is involved, is, there's a bony bank heart okay. lesion. Capsule is sometimes is damaged. Or, um, uh, it's, uh, labrum is also deficient. So we need to make the decision whether we need to treat it either arthroscopically. Right. Arthroscopically, we put a couple of holes, one from the back I use, okay. and uh, then look into it. And there are a couple of portals on the front, mm. which we call a small holes in the front. Mm. And what we do is we mobilize this part of, uh, of the uh, soft tissues, which is uh, capsule and the labrum, and bring it back to its place and use some specific anchors, two or three anchors, into the glenite bone to fix it. Because you can imagine that this head is stable in here. So are these like metallic screws or something? Uh, or are they no, just, no, just they're, stitches they're, or what uh, are they? They're specific anchors like okay. plastic plastic, uh, plastic material. And, how and some, some of them are uh, resorbable uh, okay. anchors. So they're resorbable they, as well? Over the time, they, they become, you can say that. In, like stitches? They become a bone. They, they're inside the bone. Okay. The stitches goes into the tissues and bring it forward in uh, front of the okay. glenoid. So it protects us from getting out again. Okay. So after that, so there's the a surgery. Typically, how long does it take, and how much uh, of a blood loss is there? Is it under general anesthesia or local? And how fast can you recover after it? For example, how fast do you go home? And then what is the post care? And then when can you start actual movement again? The shoulder surgery yeah. uh, varies with time because if someone is a lean, thin person, it hmm. will, it's usually an hour and a half surgery. But uh, a lot of guys, they're big, and if the patient is uh, overweight, so it takes more time, usually between an hour and a half to two and a half so hours. So this is the arthroscopic this surgery? This is keyhole surgery. Key we don't surgery. open the shoulder. Okay. It's just for two, three, four small right. holes Making in the holes. shoulder, and we fix it. So there are no scars as such, There's only no two, scars. three holes. There's no scars. Okay. Rehab-wise, it's very important. It's not the surgery which is important. It's mm -hmm. the rehab which is more important. That patient needs to be educated that, look, it will stiffen up for four to six weeks, which we allow it mm -hmm. deliberately for these tissues, which we brought it back to heal. Okay. And when they heal, they get strength. Then they start gentle physios, gentle movements. So it's up to three to four months. So they're not lifting weights. They're not, uh, they're uh, cooperating with their physiotherapist to do a proper rehab. So I would say if somebody is a, let's say a tennis player or a sports, uh, person, I would say, look, it will take time. It will take at least, uh, you, you should think about six to nine months oh. uh, to get there to back to the competitive sports. And how much sports. rest is essential when they say that a, play, uh, a sports player is unfit now? So for how long is rest essential? And then when does the rehab start? And then for how long does the rehab go on? It depends on the injury, okay. uh, what injury that person had. No. Uh, for example, uh, if it's a rotator cuff tear, which you can right. see here, if yeah. that is damaged, partially damaged and just stitched, so still healing, tendon healing takes between 8 to 12 weeks. So okay, eight usually to 12 weeks then. 3 months out of the question. So, so 3 months a minor he should repair. not be moving, he should be on rest, uh, otherwise... I'm not saying moving, uh, normally the shoulder surgery, after the shoulder sling? surgery they stay in the sling for 4 okay. weeks, for 4 okay. to 6 weeks I would say. And then gently, they can move the shoulder like that, but for example if I repair, I've done an anterior stabilization, right. Uh, then they to should. prevent the hmm. dislocations, I ask them to not to move their arm like in this direction okay. because that's the that's the position where that's the shoulder to comes out. Again. So it so will this dislocate. This about again. dislocation. What about frozen shoulder? What does that mean? How is it different from a dislocated yes, shoulder? Uh, the but frozen shoulder is a, a disease of old age or a middle okay. age. I would say the mostly in diabetics okay. when their capsule is contracted and it gets thick. Okay. and it avoids, uh, it, pre it actually the it restricts the movements okay. and uh, it can also occur after uh, injury or trauma hmm. and mainly that is again in the middle to old age, old age group. So what happens is your shoulder movements, as I said to you, the shoulder moves in all directions right. almost, right? So their movements are restricted. For example, their arm is not going higher than that. Okay. And for example, the most important one is that if you see this arm, I'm putting my elbow here and moving here, hmm. right? Normal person move up to here, hmm. right? For a sports person, I used to be a fast bowler and I can move my arm up to here, okay. right? But this movement for frozen shoulder doesn't go out. It right. blocks here. So and similarly, other movements like putting the clothes on they and bringing it back, it's very so difficult. what is the for cause them. of a frozen shoulder? Old age? It's, uh, uh, oh. it's, it's in medical terms, it's called adhesive capsulitis. Okay, so they so start the capsule together. is <laughs> inflamed, yeah. it's constricted, it's thickened. 
and the head inside the capsule doesn't move properly. Mm -hmm. So the treatment for that essentially is, uh, uh, I'm, I'm talking about international standards. Okay. Usually people over here in Pakistan, they're, they're very scared of getting injected into the shoulder joint. Right. Yeah. So inside the joint, we inject steroid and local anesthetics, which okay. acts locally. And it reduces the inflammation. inflammation. So that's the reason behind it. And this is it. an accepted norm that you were practicing in England. Absolutely. Back and how many times do they get the steroid injection? And you need to tell them that you get it from a professional and get it in the right dose and repeat it at the right interval so that there are no other side effects. Well, I myself had two injections when I was playing cricket. Okay. In one of the seasons, I had uh, terrible pain and uh, uh, tendonitis. And I had to have an injection. And then the, the next part is the physiotherapy rehab okay. and the exercises, the shoulder stretching exercises. Hmm. You have to do them and you have to wait. For example, as I said, normally it's 8 to 12 weeks of wait okay. to get back to the competitive sport. So this injection does not have side effects because a lot of people think that a lot of steroid injections for that matter are going to, you know, or disintegrate or dissolve the bone and everything and it gets thinner. So could you tell them that this is not the usual steroid injection that people are giving just right, left and center and it has to be given in a very specific manner in a specific site with a certain dosage? Well, that's a very good, good question for our people because mm -hmm. their um, uh, awareness is that steroids is bad for, the, yes. for us. Okay. It's not like that. Steroids given orally, for example, in tablet form or inject, injection into the right. muscles yes. Uh, yes. goes and works in the whole body. It has effect on the whole body. Exactly. Steroids specifically given into the joint, hmm. they act 90% act inside the joint. Okay. So it's, it's, I don't say that it, it causes because there are risks like renal damage, mm. renal failure, osteoporosis, and like you said, people say exactly. that it resorbs the bone. Yes. It's the systemic steroids which does that. So the that. one in the joint does not it harm is you. not. Okay, what about the people who are, you know, claiming to be uh, fixing these frozen shoulders and shoulder pains with a lot of lasers and stuff like that, and some of them are injecting, uh, you know, I don't know, well, these things lasers, into it. Well, these lasers, it's first time when I moved back to Pakistan <laughs> after 17 years right. from UK, yeah. I, I started hearing that, oh, we'll treat your knee with a laser, we'll exactly. treat your shoulder with a yeah. laser. And it's and a cold laser and God knows what it's, not. <laughs> it's, it's all fake. Yeah, it's There's fake. nothing like that where we use laser to treat a shoulder It's just a, a shoulder treatment joint. for, I think, for two, three days maybe they feel mm, better. No, I don't think so. Not, to be not honest, it's not recommended treatment in the West, okay. I would say, because uh, whatever we have learned over there, it's, uh, it's based on some research models. Exactly. And all the years of training, I've never seen anybody offering in NHS or in England, uh, I'll, I'll treat your shoulder with a laser. Uh, a few of the uh, patients coming from, uh, from uh, north, from hmm. KPK, when they told me, yeah. I told them, look, it's not a laser, it's just a keyhole surgery. We put sm two small holes, usually they mix it up no, with no, the they laser don't. surgery. You know what they're thinking is, that they, they, these people who are selling it, they just have some sort of devices that they're really fancy devices and they just keep it on there and you know they're saying oh you're getting some sort of radiation which no. is which is no. a, I, 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 I totally don't recommend that to yeah. be honest this is uh, usually there are too many business centers yes, in exactly. Pakistan and they sell these kind of treatments even I would say stem cells for grade 3 and grade yes, 4 they're doing that it's, as well huh? it's 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 just not good it's so all good. these lasers, all these therapies, so-called stem cell therapy, where they are charging the other person millions, the patients are actually paying so much of money for these so-called stem cells and the so-called lasers. Could you please tell our, all our patients out there that all, whether it's a device, whether it's a gun, whether it is whatever, it is not going to do it's them not, any good. It's, it's, yeah. it's not research proven, mm -hmm. it's not, it's not uh, what we call it, uh, they uh, say that it's approved. It's okay. approved for research in the West. Uh, they say FDA approved. FDA has not approved no. uh, stem cells for knee arthritis. And uh, grade 3, grade 4 arthritis, uh, usually people are scared of having a knee replacement. So they say they'll go with anything. Even people are selling them crap for millions. Exactly. They'll take it. What about PRP, the platelet-rich plasma? Does it PRP. have a role in, uh, you know, in the health of the joint and, or that? Or you know, some physiotherapists are doing things like dry needling. Does that help as well? Well, there is a science behind behind it. Right. Uh, if you, uh, if for my audience, uh, PRP is a platelet-rich plasma. Right. So platelet has got growth factors. Yeah. Plasma has got some growth factors. Joints, all the joints have cartilage which do not have a blood supply. Hmm. If there, if the joint is uh, cartilage is thinning out, or if there is an injury to the cartilage, then obviously there is no blood supply. It's not going to heal. 
So PRP is, uh, is, uh, is a good source of treatment for these kind of injuries plus tendinitis. For example, someone has a tendinitis in, uh, as I explained, the uh, hmm. supraspinatus or greater cuff tendons. So they heal well with the PRP injections, but that's again the young age group. But can you please also tell them that, you know, a lot of people call themselves aesthetic physicians these days. They just learn injectables from anybody and everybody. And then they start claiming that they're doing PRP. Can you please tell them that, okay, doing it for rejuvenation is another thing, but to make that PRP and to inject in the joint is solely for the orthopedic surgeon to do. I agree with you and uh, for aesthetics I would say as I said to you why we inject the joint because joint do not have any blood supply when joints do not have a blood supply we uh, augment them with the PRP treatments and this but uh, I mean this is an industry like aesthetics and people doing so many things I can't name them facial this and facial that and PRP injections into the hair uh, roots yeah, and yeah. all those things so this is an industry, people are getting money from it and the people who goes to them, I think they have extra money. <laughs> they have to, spare money. They want to spend some money. Right. So I would say, uh, I can't explain them uh, what to do. Uh, what I say is why we inject into the, yeah, uh, where joint. the tendons are yeah. attached or into the joints because they don't have uh, regenerative capacity. They right. don't have a blood supply, it's not going to heal and it's going yeah. to have that uh, augmented But only you would know the insertion where exactly to Absolutely. inject, right? Absolutely. Because you can uh, actually damage a nerve or something if somebody who doesn't know how to do it is doing it. I agree with that and yeah. sometimes, for example, in shoulder, I inject PRP under x-rays, right. uh, image intensifier. It's all image to, guided. To inject image guided, right. exact into the location where I need to inject. And, and same goes with the knee and uh, if someone uh, there, I mean, this is a big country and, and people are doing all sort of things. Knee injections can be traumatic if you're injecting and you're just poking into the bone yeah. or poking into the meniscus and poking into the ligament. Because if I show you a knee model. Yeah, let's so move to the knee now. Knee, knee yes. joint, uh, what we do, I do a lot of arthroscopic surgeries. There are different surgeries for different things. So yes. if we see here, there's a kneecap mm. and right. it has got a cartilage. Mm. And again, this is a femur, the thigh bone. It has got the white cartilage here and the other bone has got the, uh, which okay. is tibia, yeah. leg bone, which is called the cartilage here. Mm. And in between that, there's a meniscus, which is, we call it rings. Uh, and, and these are cartilaginous structures. And again, there's a ligament, which is called ACL and another ligament, which goes back, which is called posterior cruciate ACL. ligament. Mm. And on the both sides, there are two ligaments. That's mm. a medial collateral ligament and that's a lateral collateral ligament. Right. So there are so many important structures <coughs> needs to be intact, mm. needs to be strong to keep the knee going for sports and, uh, uh, and sporting activities. So what I say is uh, when we do the ligament reconstructions, we, we know where is the ligament, we know how to make the portals and we know how it's stable. So it's not that uh, everybody can go inside the joint and fix everything up. So you know when they talk about the knee, a lot of people are actually affected by osteoarthritis and they say because of this it's not just the injury but it's the osteoarthritis, the age, the knees are degenerating or whatsoever and then they're, they're advised an arthroplasty or a knee replacement. So who are the candidates for a knee replacement and who are the candidates for an arthroscopy where you said you have to repair the tendons and everything and it, you don't have to replace the whole joint and who are the candidates who can you know be cured with any sort of injection whether it's fillers with hyaluronic acid or steroid or whatsoever. So please uh, if you yes. could grade them. Mm, there are I mean I would say the people who are under let's say 40 they should mm. say that uh, they are uh, they are not a candidate for anything uh, except they have uh, any injury. Okay. If <clears throat> young people have any injuries while playing sports or while even running or if somebody had a twisting knee injury and they damage their ligaments which is mm. the most important ligament is the ACL and right. cruciate ligament then they need arthroscopic treatment. Mm -hmm. If the meniscus is torn it's a source of pain for example if you can show it here if yeah. it's torn it's gonna stuck in here it, it will give a feeling of catching or sometimes there's a bucket handle tear which is which causes the locking of the knees. Okay. For example, if somebody has bent the knee and now they can't straighten the leg. Hmm. So that is called locking. Okay. So those case, those types of injuries under 50, they need to be treated Arthroscopy. with arthroscopies. Okay. And the people who are above 50, I would say above 60, mm -hmm. uh, the above 60 group, if they have established arthritis, because the first investigation 
for middle to old age group is should be the standing x-rays okay. ap views and lateral views and there's a uh, we call it shesh views so to see okay. how is the cartilage for okay. for orthopedic surgeon they need to know this how to look into those x-rays hmm. and assess whether it's arthritis if it's a bad arthritis a grade 3 to grade 4 arthritis they do not need any MRI scan. Okay. Uh, over here, people uh, mostly have private treatments and yeah. everyone comes with the x-rays and MRIs. Because MRI, is go if it's a grade three, four arthritis, uh, it's guaranteed that meniscus are torn, it's guaranteed sometimes that ACL is deficient, it's, it's damaged, mm -hmm. and it's guaranteed that they'll have a worn cartilage here, which, uh, uh, which is uh, which is source of pain of the anterior you, know, you just mentioned that you know an X-ray would do, and we don't really need an MRI. Whereas in Pakistan, people because they're running a commercial practice, they tend to you know they have to prescribe an MRI irrespective of the person's pocket just to make money out of it, right? But could you please explain your journey in England and how you would not uh, you know prescribe all these tests unless it was absolutely essential, and then always do the conservative approach where you first start doing different things and then go for the really uh, you know invasive approach out there. No, thank you very much for uh, this question and uh, my journey is a bit long and I uh, graduated from Findlay Medical College uh, in year 98-99. Initially I was uh, very keen uh, to become a general surgeon, I want to do laparoscopic surgeries, vascular surgeries and stuff. Uh, I did uh, FCPS training in Holy Family in the year 2001 and 2. And in 2003, I realized that I, had, I need to go, uh, go to UK to do my training. And uh, I wanted to become a surgeon, a general surgeon, wanted to do FRCS. But when I went there, I, I got exposure to orthopedics because orthopedics uh, at that time over here was just uh, uh, fixing the broken bones. Mm. Over here, over there, I worked a year initially at a junior level as a senior house officer. And uh, they were doing arthroscopies for knees, for shoulders. They were doing knee replacements, hip replacements, shoulder replacements, and they were doing uh, like uh, 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 minimally cons uh, invasive things like uni knee replacements, a partial knee replacement. Oh, there's something so at that time I developed. Well? Yes, okay. at that time I developed my interest, and I initially did my MRCS uh, to get to the orthopedics training, and then orthopedics I've, I trained for uh, eight years in orthopedics and I completed my FRCS in uh, trauma and orthopedics and I'm a fellow of Royal College of Surgeons of England and uh, I did a couple of fellowship trainings uh, especially in hips and knees and then a ear and shoulder uh, surgery and training. This, this is like 10 years after your MBBS that you have Absolutely. you know dedicated to joints but over here in Pakistan when something happens to our knee or anything people go to a uh, masseur or a uh, wrestler, Pehlwan they call yeah. them and they just kind of maneuver it and fix it somehow and they send them home and then we have so uh, such a big population, such a large group of our population that remains disabled. You see them on the roads, you see them everywhere and they're an, a burden to the economy. So could you please kindly stress it more and more that more and more students need to come to this one to this speciality like you or the people out there suffering need to understand the difference and go to a trained doctor to you know, to save themselves from that disability for life. Well, I agree with you. I can't agree more than that. That, uh, look, this is the way forward, but uh, we have, uh, still, we are way behind uh, reg with regards to teaching and training. Mm -hmm. And uh, I myself was very keen to join <coughs> my alma mater and, and uh, train people right. and teach them. I, I went uh, to RMU and offered my services. Look, I am, I, I can, I'm trained in hip, knees and shoulders. I can replace them. I can redo them if it's some, someone has done uh, a wrong replacement or if, if, if it failed then I can revise them mm -hmm. and I can do uh, arthroscopy or keyhole surgery of these three, three joints and I think uh, I, I don't know whether they have uh, got the message wrong that I'm after a job or anything like that <laughs> no, it's and, about uh, then the I, and, and they said oh we don't have funds we don't have this and we don't have that we don't have a vacancy for you then I, I decided I should stay pri private and I'm I'm Working, uh, I mean, if I get an opportunity, someone comes with me, I teach them. I go to uh, Raul Pindi Medical College orthopedic departments at times to teach and train as well. Whenever they require, they have uh, teaching uh, meetings. So you spoke about failed. So we have something over here that you were mentioning earlier. Well, so I was telling you that, uh, and how do you yes, I mean, this is one of my patients. Uh, okay. She's around, I think, 88, 89. But she had, uh, this is a knee replacement oh, okay. done 30 years back. 
Right. And uh, that was, I think, done uh, was done in the U.S. Uh, mm -hmm. if I'm not wrong. And she has arthritis on the other side as right. well. But I must say that I did not offer her a knee replacement because mm. her muscle functions were not good. Okay. She her she has a very poor quadricep strength. She cannot walk independently. So it's not that every person person who comes mm. to us uh, we do we just uh, uh, stick a knee yeah. in. So I just reassured her. I, I gave her some good painkillers, physiotherapy, rehab. So that's that's the way who it is. We being a surgeon. So not everybody is a candidate for absolutely. What I about mean, people with uh, who are like diabetic, severely diabetic, who have hypertension, and what would you prescribe them? Do do they? Uh, can those they are them? not the contraindications. Okay, they're, they're uh, even in the West, when we do a knee replacement, hmm. most of the people uh, they are overweight. Okay. So the people. Uh, usually have more weight, their knee uh, wear is accelerated. So diabetes or hypertension or some people, I mean over here as well, I've done people had a cardiac stents. So we can manage them. Okay. It's not the contraindications for uh, uh, a knee replacement in experienced hands. And the second important thing is the knee replacement should be done in a good clinical setup, in a good yes, hospital yeah. where they have a dedicated orthopedic theatres to prevent infection. Exactly. That's very important. And the third thing is, is the post-operative care. Okay. The surgeon, if it doesn't know that how to look after the patient, yeah. how to send them to a rehab and how to guide the physiotherapist for the rehab because all physiotherapists are not trained for joint replacement surgery because in our uh, teaching the hospitals, in our government hospitals, there are not much uh, mm. joint replacement surgery, so th they don't get exposure. Right. So they, uh, initially when I started, they used to do the same things, the heat pads oh, or yeah, the, uh, the tens stands, and machine. this yeah. and that, and I had to train them. I have uh, three or four physiotherapists so in my team. we have for specific physiotherapy regimen for people who have on undergone knee replacement, that's Absolutely. what you're saying, right? Absolutely, they are. So what about the shoes and uh, the things like that? Let's talk about braces and shoes and posture and you know the things that you need to uh, ensure while um, for a healthy knee. For healthy knees, the mm -hmm. most important is to look after your weights. Okay. And the second thing is uh, what you do is you do daily exercises. Uh -huh. You do a walk for half an hour. Uh, mm -hmm. We being. Uh, uh, professionals, we keep uh, working, uh, going moving here around. and they're yeah. moving around. So I would say that is uh, enough, but it's not enough with regards to strength of the muscles. So Dr. Anwar, we know that the shoes play a very important role and they say heels are not really good for you. So what kind of shoes do you advise to everybody who's exercising and who's on the move all the time? Which is the ideal shoe for you? Uh, the shoe, I would say, uh, uh, for a young people, it doesn't matter. For example, uh, young women, when they go on parties, they, they wear high heels. That's fine. It's not <laughs> okay, bad. That's okay. <laughs> but for every day, if somebody is wearing a high heels, uh, that obviously, I, I've, I've never experienced it, but it's difficult to balance, yeah. I would say. So as a balancing act, it gives you more tiredness. And uh, for people who have problems with their joints, uh, problems with their back, they can use comfortable shoes. I would say comfortable shoe in, in them, it, it could be a normal uh, wide shoe if they, they, okay. they're using a leather shoe or they can use a sketches, they can use joggers. So it depends on person to person. An important thing is to look after your weight and uh, do regular exercises. So that and what about climbing? Is climbing and hiking or climbing the stairs bad for the knee or is it okay? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, being an orthopedic surgeon, I would say, uh, when I was playing sports, um, I would say before 40s, uh, there's nothing difficult for human beings. They can <laughs> climb 40. mountains, they yeah. can run here and there, uphill, downhill, doesn't matter. But if someone has a problem in the knee, hmm. for them, hiking is not a good idea. Okay. Because if the knee pain is coming, it can be due to the cartilage wear, it can be due to the, some ligament or uh, meniscus injury or, or, uh, or uh, degenerative changes. So if someone having those problems is doing a hiking for a couple of hours, three hours, probably it's accelerated wear because if, if you go uphill, so obviously the yeah. biomechanics of the knee changes. Right. So that's difficult. And with regards to stairs, I mean, I, I like coming downstairs. <laughs> I, don't, I take lifts when I have to go to ninth floor. I don't, I don't take stairs. Right. So, and uh, it's because of one of my uh, trainer, 
he was also orthopod and he never took that and I, I sometimes tried to so convince him when relevant. I was in my 20s oh. that we should do that. He said, uh, I, I, I like to preserve my knees. All right. so, so what about swimming? How good is that? They swimming is very good. Very it's good. good for all the muscles. It's good for all the joints. And uh, if somebody is doing, uh, I, I say, 40 minutes or half an hour swimming every day, that's very good. Oh, or that's, that's uh, every day is difficult, I would say, in everyone's, every professional's life. Uh, three to yeah. four times a week is, is yes, enough. So Dr. Inma, a lot of our people nowadays are on drugs, unfortunately. A lot of young students out there are taking ice and these kind of things and they think it's very fashionable. And they end up with things like AVN, avascular necrosis in the hip. And then they have to come in and they have to go for a hip replacement. I'm not talking about the older ones, they do. They need it for other reasons, but especially our young population and they don't realize how much of a damage are they doing with these drugs. Could you please talk about AVN as well as hip replacement and how they need to preserve it rather than go for a hip, hip replacement? It's disastrous. I would say if, uh, over here, if uh, some uh, mostly uh, these drugs are used for the people who are, uh, who are rich people, to be yeah. honest. The poor people's problems are different. Uh, exactly. And if they're kids in colleges and universities, they're taking drugs, that's a disastrous. Hmm. I mean, this is a duty of uh, parents, I would say, uh, as well as, as teachers, uh, try to uh, pre prevent that. And the people who get the damage get avascular necrosis of the femoral head, which is more import, uh, right. most common, and uh, because uh, it's blood supply is always compromised. Mm. I mean, uh, and uh, again, the other joint, which is a shoulder joint, which gets AVN. Uh, usually, we do uh, some surgeries we call core decompressions, where we uh, drill some holes into the head of humerus or head okay. of femur and uh, give them some uh, bisphosphonates and calcium and okay. vitamin D. Uh, to try to pre preserve, preserve them, them. For, uh, for years to come. But most of them, they fail. That's, right. that's, the, that's the fact, to be honest. Uh, and uh, they end up getting a joint replacement. Uh, for hips, it's most common because you have to walk. And uh, these two joints, hips and knees, are important with the respect that if you can't, if you have a painful hip, yeah, then you're, you're stable then, for life. Then you're, yeah. you're done for life. And, uh, Usually, I mean, I've done, uh, recently I've done a person's uh, bilateral uh, in a hip staged uh, procedure, a hip replacement. He was, he, he was around 26, but he was not a drug user. He, uh, unfortunately, mm. sadly, he had a COVID in that oh, COVID okay. time, and he had uh, treatment in one of the uh, biggest hospital here in Islamabad, where mm. they treated him with steroids. And that actually was so the treatment. it's not just drugs, it's steroids, it's steroids and it's also these well. heavy metals and all heavy these metals. things that the kushtas or you know, formulations that a lot of hakims Absolutely. out there are Absolutely. advising. Or, you know, uh, when, when people start having things without labels on them and, you know, so anybody prescribes Absolutely. them and, and they just take it. Take and why it. should one take risk with yeah. not knowing what he or she is eating? Exactly. Because uh, I would say homeopathic, take those medicines. They have some mm. uh, ingredients written. Yeah, they have it. So if they don't work, they won't harm you. Right. But these uh, other things uh, though, Hakimi yeah. medicines and these kushtas and stuff most of them they they put steroids in it yes because right. steroids are anti-inflammatory they uh, relieve give you an pain. instant energy well-being absolutely you know. absolutely but the problem is mm. they damages your bone yeah. they can your do osteoporosis well. they can do renal failure they can damage your eyesight they can even uh, cause damage to the heart I mean exactly. these are the things so everybody nowadays is on the phone and we have this tech neck kind of thing. So what would you advise them, people on the phone all the time, you know, crouched? So what is the ideal posture? How do they preserve their neck and their back? And let's come to back pains as well. Well, neck ideal posture pain. is this. Can yeah. you imagine somebody putting their mobile there yeah. and looking into but the mobile yeah, all the we time? You can have no. that selfie stick for you it. You can no? do like that. <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 but it yeah. looks odd, isn't it? Exactly. So we shouldn't waste a lot of time on mobiles. Exactly. That's what I would say to the teenagers, to young people as well. Even to myself, I would say, I mean, recently I don't use a lot of mobile, but uh, when Facebook was new, you keep on looking yeah, what, what people have posted, <laughs> what I'm going to post, what I No, even uh, I've got a, a PA who posts on the Facebook and stuff like that. So spending hours on, uh, on the social media is, is not healthy. Uh, that's that's, so that's the message you'd rather watch the, the TV? People. That's why we're Absolutely. doing a television program because Absolutely. TV is healthy, it's right in front of you and it doesn't, you know, Absolutely. spoil your posture. Yeah. Absolutely. Doctor, yeah. if you think yeah. about uh, now, if, if you brought up this topic, at homes, hmm. people are using mobile in different rooms and they're not sitting together. Exactly. And even parents 
kids and and to be honest i'm working on my kids as well that uh, from nine o'clock onwards there shouldn't be no gadgets exactly and if we but have to see for a tv we, we will sit in a tv lounge and we'll watch a tv we, we can watch a documentary we can yeah. watch a movie together yeah. and this is important people are not having family life people have no values and people think that oh my my kid is going into let's this big school or a beacon yeah. house or a city school or over <laughs> here troubles and stuff like that whatever they learn they yeah. learn from that school and from those kids and most i mean people need to uh, be aware that their children uh, who are their friends yeah. what are their backgrounds so good so, habits good posture absolutely. what about diet what are the most essential things in a diet for good joint health like vitamin d calcium magnesium how what what in natural and what in supplements and let's talk about glucosamine chondritin as well absolutely ab hmm. absolutely uh, what i would say uh, for a diet perspective uh, the dairy products have calcium yeah. so you can name them milk yogurts and and cheese and butter and all those things so this is important uh, for different age group for for example if somebody is in 70s he can't take butter and cheese if he has a heart problem heart and problem, stuff but yes. he can have milk right so he can have milk he can have yogurt so this is the first thing and second is uh, everyone should have some activity level so for bone health uh, it need you need to brisk walk or run or a jog to give to keep the bone metabolism going okay. so i'll explain it that if the bone uh cells bone has two cells mm. uh and all the cells of the body they need calcium mm. so even brain cells need calcium uh, you you know that nerve action potential need needs calcium, calcium as well. right yeah. so if somebody is not taking any calcium in the diet it doesn't mean that uh, the body uh, mm. will provide calcium uh, to that cell okay. and it take it from the bone so bones will get weaker and weaker yeah. so that's the one thing if you brisk walk or a jog what happens is the bone metabolism increases and it Uptake gets strengthened it's yeah. it's better and muscle strength gets better blood flow to the uh, to the muscles to the tendons gets better you'll get you'll get less pain right. plus with the exercise you will get uh, dopamine and and this endorphins happy and these well. these yeah. these feel happy kind of chemicals right. i would say these hormones yeah. what about so vitamin d almost our entire nation is vitamin uh, d deficient and they are because nobody go, wants to go into the sun in yeah. summer obviously we can't go uh, no, uh, face the sun <laughs> it's uh, you'll burn yeah. but in even in winter we don't get sunlight yeah. uh, houses are built like that we don't have gardens yeah. and uh, we don't have time to sit out uh, somewhere where in sunlight every day for half an hour right. so that's a vitamin d for you so vitamin d is produced if people uh, want to know that that sunlight ultraviolet light light act on the skin right. or, or exposed let's yeah. say forearms and face that's enough and for half an hour what happens there is a cholesterol or a, uh, under mm. the skin which changes into some form of vitamin d okay. and that goes into the liver and in the liver there are enzymes which changes to a different type of vitamin d and that goes into the kidneys so it's very and important to take it the natural route it's very important and not the supplements uh, supplements <laughs> uh, people are deficient they don't take it as a dietary thing okay. so they end up on the supplements hmm. if they are deficient they have to take supplements to get better but you don't need to be on supplements for the let's say 20 30 years for the rest of your life oh, that's so that's true. the important thing that is really nice what about back pains now and for example somebody has some problem with the spine or the spinal cord and everything what kind of surgery options are there like laminectomy or decompression or all of that and do you do those as well uh, i did 6 months training in spine but i okay. don't do spinal surgeries okay. i see the back ache patients i see okay. the teenagers with scoliosis or spine deformities i guide them uh, most of the spine conditions and back aches do not need surgery even disc discogenic disease disc prolapses they do better if they do uh, the special exercises back stretches core training exercises for 6 months to a year they do get better along with some painkillers if as and when needed hmm. uh, but some some spine conditions they do need surgery for example it's uh, if a disc bulge is so big it has compromised the spinal cord uh, we call it chordaicoenis acute disc prolapse causing chordaicoenis syndrome that needs spine spinal decompression 
and for old age people, if someone having spinal stenosis, like if the spinal canal on the back of our, 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 our back, uh, there's a spinal canal, if it's compromised and it's, it, if it's pressing on the spinal cord or the exiting nerve roots right. and patients are having weakness in the, let's say, a big toe or a ankle dorsiflexion or, or, or weakness in the leg, they should go immediately to the center where there's a spinal surgeon and they need to have spinal decompression surgery. And in Pakistan, usually the neurosurgeons, they do that. There are few, I, I would say there are very few spinal trained surgeons here uh, because this specialty is not, uh, uh, not at all uh, developed in the Pakistan. So Dr. Anwar, while we, ha we have to now wind up the program, but what good message can you give to our viewers out there regarding the hips, the knees, and the shoulders all in one go as precise as you can be okay first of all I would say everyone should look after to their health looking after their weight daily exercise for half an hour and uh, then uh, if a young person with a sports injury he should visit a sports surgeon wherever in Pakistan there are you can find it out on even on internet uh, around you who's the sports surgeon uh, with joints hips knees and shoulders uh, what I try to uh, uh, prevent them to going to a joint replacement surgery but when if it's obvious you have to go it that is the stage where uh, for example your knee is hurting you had injections you had hyaluronic acid you had physiotherapy if it's not working for you and your life is miserable your sleep is affected by the knee arthritis then the knee replacement is uh, is the appropriate choice and for, for a lot of people who want to know that uh, because I've seen patients that someone had the knee replacement and didn't work, I would say get it done by a trained surgeon, get it done in a good hospital, not in a small setup where uh, they don't have a dedicated orthopedic theatres and get it done where you need, to, you need to investigate your surgeon who is doing your surgery, where he is trained from, he, had, he has any training or, or is he training on you. So that's thank what you. I would say. Thank you so, so much. Thank important. you so much, Dr. Anwar Kiani, for joining us today. And we had with us Dr. Anwar Kiani. He's an orthopedic and sports surgeon. And as you heard it from him, if you have a problem, don't let them train on you. Get and go to a trained surgeon because you can actually trust them. And it's all about your joints and your bones. The more you move them, the more you keep them in motion, the better they get. They get more blood supply, they get more nutrients, and you can stay moving for your whole life. Thank you so much for watching. Inshallah, we'll meet you next week. Thank you and Allah Hafiz.